Why still waiting for the meeting scheduled between the Vatican authorities and the representatives of the German Episcopal Conference to discuss the German Synodal Council in a few days? Some proposals for the reconciliation between the two positions have begun to emerge. One of them was made by Cardinal Kaspar, a German who has been very critical of the German Synodal Council. Let us remember that the Synodal Council that the German wants is a council in which the laity, priests and the bishops, the bishops in the case of the Episcopal Conference, the parish priests in the case of the parishes, enter with equal rights in terms of voice and vote, and that the bishop, the Episcopal Conference, the bishop or the parish priest has the duty to abide by and to put into practice what they have voted in that meeting. Well, Kaspar has said that there would be a hallway and has proposed what he did with when he was the Bishop of Rothenburg before he was called to the Vatican by St. John Paul II. What he did in that diocese, a diocesan synodal council, the laity have the right to vote, but after they have voted, it is the bishop who has to implement that result which has been decided by a vote. It is not very clear that what Caspar said, if the bishop in this case, the pastor, would have been the obligation to apply it, or he would reserve a vote, a right to veto. In any case, the situation is obviously tense, because if the bishop or the priest in the parish did not agree in conscience with what the majority composed, I repeat, on equal term also by the laity, is what the majority has decided and approved. There would be tension because if they reject it, if they could reject it, if they could reject it, they would be under a lot of pressure, even attacked at least in certain media. And if they accept it, they, when they do not agree with it, they would be going against their own conscience. This is very important debate, I believe, takes us back to something that has already happened in the church a few centuries ago, what was known as the considerism. It seems to me that it is the same thing, although with different names. Already in the 7th century and certainly in the 11th century, with Cardinal Humbert, deceiver, candida, the question arose as to whether there was any authority above the Pope to remove a Pope in the case of his failing into heresy. Another authority, a little later in the 12th century, is the Camadocele monk Grossano, who collected that canons with the directors, and who also raises the question, the possibility of removing a pope who falls into heresy, understanding heresy not only as professing or defending a theological error, but also as falling in the mission of keeping the church united. But this was confirmed to the fact that, of what to do if a pope is heretic and this theorized about different options. Later, and we enter already in the 14th century, the situation changes. Important thinkers of that time, for example, Marcileus of Padua or William of Ockham already said, theorize that the pope do not have the supreme authority, but it is the body, the whole, that is, the head. The Pope with the rest of the members, or in other words, the Pope with the cardinals or the Pope with the council, who would have the authority, and that therefore the Pope, the head, will have the obligation to put into practice what the whole would approve. If the cardinals or the council say one thing, the Pope cannot oppose it. We are already talking about the 14th century. In this context, these were theories of some thinkers, and of course, there were others who thought the opposite. Perhaps the best known of all is William of Ockham and also Marcileus of Padua or John of Paris. But in this context, something terrible happens in the church. The so-called schism of Avignon, in which there are two popes ruling the church, and each one considered the other as anti-pope. There when even three, because a third pope is elected so that the two previous one would resign, and in the end, the other two did not want to resign. And there was a time 
when there were three popes in the church. A council meets in the city of Constantine, and in the council centered above all in the problem at the times of two popes. The conclusion is reached that the council is above the pope. That is to say, in some way the theories of Marcellus of Padua or William of Ockham are accepted. The council is above the pope, and thus the council could dismiss the two popes and appoint a third one, which was what was done. Well, the approval of the council of Constantine's was limited to the question that it was necessary to solve the problem that there were two popes in the church. 1414 to 1418 lasted that council. We are already in the 15th century then, a few years later, 1431, another council was inaugurated in the city of Basel. It had other names, other themes, but this one above all, and there is no longer affirmed that in that context of there being two popes, the council is above the pope. There it is already affirmed that, in any case and regardless of its circumstances, the council is above the pope and that the pope has the obligation to accept and implement what the council decides, what the cardinal, what the cardinal decides. The resigning pope and at that time there was only one, Pope Eugene the the fourth, refuses to accept these conclusions of the council of Basile, and the council, many council fathers certainly leave the council. Those who remain decree that Pope Eugene is an anti-pope, depose him and elect another, put the Duke of Save as Pope, year 1438, and at that time we again have two popes, one who is the one who has appointed the Council of Basel, which Pope Eugene does not recognize as legitimate, and the other, Pope Eugene, who says that he is the legitimate pope and that he does not accept the councils, the conclusion of the council. Fortunately, the Duke Save resigned as Pope ten years later and the problem was solved. This is so-called problem of conciliarism, the council above the Pope, and it has a certain similarity with what the Germans are now proposing. Although they are more than conciliarism, perhaps we say that it is a synodalism. The synod, the synodal council better said, above the episcopal conference, the bishop or the parish priest. The conclusion reached was that the Pope is the one who convokes the council, and if not that council is legitimate, and that the Pope has the right not to implement what the council approves. That is, the council can decide whatever it wants, but the Pope has the right not to apply it, not to give his consent to those constitutions or those decrees approved by the council. This is the current situation in the matter of the council. This, for example, has had its relatively re recent consequences in the last ecumenical council that was held. The Second Vatican Council, legitimately convoked by St. John XIII and carried out under the presidency of his successor, St. John Paul VI, during that council, it is known, it is no secret that the liberal minority that managed the council clashed in some of his proposals with St. Paul the sixth believed, and that unofficially the Pope made known to that minority his reservations about what they were dealing with, and told them, if you approve this as you are preparing it, I will not sign it and we will go to public confrontation. That led to the secession of the part of some and on the other of the other. As of consequence, some document of the council has a certain characteristics of a constitutional document of the constitution of a state. That is to say, it is neither yours or mine, so that it can be for everyone. But we have seen the consequence in these years. It has come as the time of applying this document that's head, and the aspect of point of ambiguity because it has been fruit of secession of some and the secession of the other. Let us come to an agreement so that we can produce a document in which we all agree even if it is neither perfect for you nor perfect for me. And that is why after the Second Vatican Council, there is talk of the need of hymenetic, that is to say, for an interpretation. Ratzinger as a theologian, then as a prefect of the doctrine of the faith, and then as Pope, raised the question of making a hermeneutic of continuity 
that is, those documents that could be understood, read and applied in one sense or another as a civil constitution. Ratzinger raises the need for them to be interpreted and applied, respecting what came before, a hermeneutic of continuity. While others, for example, the so-called Bologna school, propose the opposite, we must apply the conciliar document with a hermeneutic of rupture with respect to tradition. We must begin in some way and in some point, we must begin again. The past must be left behind. These are the consequences and we are seeing them, living them, and in some aspects, because of the internal tension in the church, we are also suffering them. What will come out of this dialogue with the Germans and the Vatican? I don't know personally. I think it would be a mistake of national synods, the assistant synods or parish council, for synod to be stopped, to be being consultative. I think it would be a mistake. Councils have to be councils, and it is very important to listen to councillors. It is very important. They have to be taken seriously. The parish council, the Presbyterian council, the Episcopal council, the councils that surround the Episcopal conferences have to be listened to and taken seriously. The laity have to be taken seriously in the council, of course, you can vote. But the councils have the councils. They cannot become bodies that either pressure the Pope, that either pressure the bishops, the parish priests, or even force them to do things against their conscience. If the council cease to be councils, we go back five centuries and possibly we have the bitter consequences of that time. We must not forget that the rejection of Eugene the Fourth of what was approved in Council of Basile, that the council is above the Pope in all circumstances, the rejection of what was the breeding ground from which Luther and the Lutheran Reformation later emerged. Another matter that worries me a lot, the Pope's health. He still has bronchitis. He is still doing his audience program, but he cannot speak. But what happened on Wednesday was very painful for me. The Pope has bronchitis. He has gone to a hospital, to the Gameli Hospital, to see if he has pneumonia or by doing a CAT scan. But they have not given him the result of that CAT scan. But of course, he has bronchitis, and he says so himself, and he cannot read the speeches. In these conditions, how it is possible? How is it possible that we could cause, subject him to spend an hour or more in St. Peter's Square in the cold weather? It is not the middle of winter, but it is cold. At 9.30 in the morning, and that they put him in a Pope mobile and drive him around the square. The Pope mobile does not go at full speed, but at least it moves. How is it possible? That they do this with an old man of 87 years old. If he has bronchitis, the normal thing is that the audiences, in the case he wants to do them, should be heard in the Nebi Hall, in the Pope, the sixth hall, which he is more sheltered. That is what I would do with my father. I would not expose him with bronchitis and enable him to speak with difficulty in Britain. I would not expose him to the cold air of the morning. It seems to me sincerely a bad treatment, and I can only think of one thing, and it is very flattering if this is how he is being treated by those who supposedly have to take care of him and supposedly love him. With this, it seems to me that the Pope does not need enemies. He is 87 years old and cannot be exposed and subjected to necessary risk. If he wants to make the audiences at his decision, if he wants to continue having a public visibility, I ask please that it be in the Pope, the sixth hall, and that he is not exposed to the cold, so that he does not suffer more. We pray for the Pope. Until next week, God willing.